We are in part one of the book, Who is the Holy Spirit? Examining the nature of the spiritual realm so that we can try and identify the fingerprint, as it were, of the person of the Holy Spirit. And so here we are examining the fallen angels, the unclean spirits, the demons. And this, uh, what we're going to talk about, is not, I suspect, a popular topic. It certainly is not a self-serving theology. Um, something along the lines of a self-serving theology with respect to the enemy is, uh, no weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. I can just rebuke the devil and he's just rebuked forever. Now, am I disputing that humans have a measure of authority over the enemy? I use that authority all the time, every single day. I 100% do not dispute that. Jesus said, you will trample serpents and scorpions. They will cast out demons in my name, records Mark in chapter 16. Um, I don't dispute that. But me saying, I can just I can just trample, trample, trample the enemy and he is just done forever and, and I can just route him and he's just routed and he can't touch me. That, that's a self-serving theology whenever my Bible says, right, uh, watch out for your adversary, the lion, the devil, like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Like he, <laughs> he devours people and we put on armor. Most of it is defensive armor um, in anticipation of him coming. But my point that I want to make in this video, which is, not, again, not a self-serving theology, is that ultimately who we have to deal with when it comes to spiritual warfare and when it comes to dealing with the devil and his demons is God. And God actually is the one who sends the demons. Now, Satan is called the chief of devils or the prince of devils in the New Testament. And so how do we reconcile my claim that I just made that God is the one who sends demons, but Satan is the chief of devils? Well, God's the chief of every name. Jesus is the name above names. He all uh, powers and authorities were made subject unto him, writes Peter, right? And so I'm just going to go through and read uh, several of these verses and, and see that um, there is really strong biblical evidence that it is God who sends demons. And of course, the implication is if God is the one who's sending demons, then we have to deal with him. And yes, he may introduce a measure of us rebuking the enemy and so on and so forth. But ultimately, we have to do with God, right? And we answer to God and not some little peon, some little peon unclean spirit somewhere, or even the peon devil who is God's handmaiden, right? We answer to God first and foremost, and God is sovereign. He's not wringing his hands in heaven. Oh my gosh, I forgot Satan. And he's destroying my people. Or he's trying, saying that he's going to. Like, no, God left the enemy in the land for a reason. All things are for his glory. What is God's highest purpose? God's highest purpose is his glory. It is not to make us feel good. It is not to make us look good. It It is for his glory. And sometimes for his glory, that means that God has to knock us down. We see this repeatedly in scripture. God puts his servants in a position of being knocked down. Joseph is thrown in jail. Daniel is thrown in the lion's den. Jesus is nailed to a cross. Paul is shipwrecked and beaten and given 39 lashes and on and on and on and on. We see continually this process of God putting his servants in peril so that he can then rescue them and put them ultimately in a place that is far superior, far more stable than they ever were before any of that happened. And so God seems to use this as a strategy in order to bring glory and honor to his name. And so one of the ways that he does that is he, he sends demons and the demons harass and pester and resist and accuse and manipulate us. But he's purifying us and he's preparing us. So enough of a lecture. Let's go to the scripture. Jesus. Um, and so this footnote that I'm reading from is actually, I have this footnote copied under an all, actually, I think, pretty much under all the verses that I'm getting ready to read. But this particular one, the footnote is on Isaiah 19.14 um, in the, the section on 
all references to spirit excluding explicit and implicit. So it's in part it's in part three of the book in the 800s in the pages. Um, and so let me just read through these scriptures. Uh, Judges 9.23, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. And so this spirit came, and somehow, you know, we're talking about a relationship of causality, somehow this spirit comes to the men of um, Shechem and Abimelech, and, you know, are they thinking if, if you if you did a some kind of a case study survey and you ask them, so what is the origin of your dispute um, with the men of Shechem? And, and they say, oh, they did this and oh, they did that. Right. But that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is that God sent an evil spirit between, uh, and this is a, a rational, powerful being that has a motive and an agenda, and they are armed with a warrant from God Most High, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and there, there is no higher name. His name is the highest name. There is no appeal. There, is, there, there isn't any other warrant. There's the warrant from Almighty Eternal Creator God. And the warrant says, I can stir up treachery between uh, Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Who, 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 if God is for us, who can be against us, right? Who, who is going to um, oppose this? Who's going to stand in front of it and say, this far and no farther? God is the one who sent it. And so the answer is nobody, not even one, not even one, none, 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 right? Nobody is going to stop this from happening. And so while you might interview the men of Shechem and say, Tell me, um, what is the source of your turmoil? They're probably not going to say an evil spirit. They're going to say, oh, this happened and that happened. They did this and they did that. But we're told, again, it's an evil spirit. Okay. Um, 1 Samuel 16, verses 14 through 15. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. So in, the, in this case, and this is the only case in Scripture where God is said to remove his Holy Spirit and to displace that, uh, to fill up that void and that gap that was left from the vacancy left by the Holy Spirit with a demon spirit, okay? Uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 21 through 22. And there came forth a spirit and stood forth before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And so God is trying to get Ahab. I mean, trying to sounds like he's like, oh, maybe I can do it. Maybe I can't do it. God is sovereign and he's going to do, he's going to make his plans work out according to his purpose, right? And so God is using the circumstance of Ahab meditating in his heart. Mm, we can get back the city, Ramoth Gilead. And God's going to be like, you're going to die in that battle. And so I'm going to send him there, right? Uh, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him wherewith. And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit. And so we get the fruit of the spirit in the, um, we get the fruit of the spirit by what it does. Judge a tree by its fruit. And the action is that it, it, it inspires deceitful speech. I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And so this spirit, this spirit right here is so powerful, not to exalt the enemy, it's it's just what the Bible states. It's so influential that it's not just a lying, lying spirit in one man, but all the prophets. And how many there were dozens or maybe even hundreds of prophets that were all blathering on. And this, this spirit was stirring them up and influencing them and causing them to feel uh, an utterance, an unction, a quickening, a an inspiration to speak a certain thing. These men probably had a sense that the unction was from outside of them. Like I, I, I don't know that that wasn't my idea. But they clearly didn't figure out that it was an evil spirit that was doing it. Right? They clearly didn't figure out that what they were saying was lies. Um, you know, most of the time people people at least give a little bit of lip service to the truth and, oh, I'm in the truth and the other person's a liar, not me. I'm telling the truth and they're a liar, right? And so t typically um, 
Typically, if people know that they're being lied to, they don't respond favorably to that. And so somehow these men, these men were deceived. The wool was pulled over their eyes. And they were believing that what they were saying was true. Maybe not. Maybe they were just wicked and they loved lies. I mean, it's entirely possible. But um, blind leading the blind, right? Uh, thou shalt uh, say, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, the Lord, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. The Lord is sending a lying spirit to influence the sons of men. Jesus. Psalm seventy-eight forty-nine. He cast upon him them the fierceness of his anger wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them and so again these evil angels they are persons just like you and i are persons they have an agenda they are armed with a warrant from almighty eternal creator god who is going to contravene that authority who is going to stand up and say i object there isn't anybody right there's no appeal and so these evil angels that God sent among them were agents that communicated fierceness and wrath, indignation, and trouble. Now, we're not told exactly what tit for tat, exactly what every single event was, but boy, it doesn't sound like, you know, it's like, um, pencil in um, fierceness and wrath and indignation and trouble. Um, we'll do that at four o'clock. Like, <laughs> like who wants to pencil that one in their schedule? I don't think that anybody does, right? Um, but God is is judging and he's testing for his purposes and he's using the enemy and evil angels to do it. Uh, Isaiah nineteen fourteen. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof, and they have caused to Egypt to error in every work thereof, as a drunketh man staggereth in his vomit. Now that's um, a pretty vivid portrayal of the results of this perverse spirit. And caused Egypt to error. And so error is... Um, Error is um, being deceived, making a wrong choice, perhaps even deceiving. And of course, you remember um, John and his first first John gives us a, a test of discerning between spirit of truth and spirit of error. And the test that he gives is because they're willing to listen to us who are the church, who are sealed with the Holy Spirit, who are ambassadors of God. We speak for God. No one can confess Jesus but by the Holy Spirit. We are confessing Jesus and we are serving him. And these people do not listen to us. And so therefore they have the spirit of error. And that's how we discern that. Okay. God sends the spirit to, in this case, it appears to be the Egyptians. Isaiah 29, 10, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. Um, Romans 11, chapter 8, and so Paul is quoting the last verse that we just read. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. He calls it something slightly different. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. First Corinthians 5, 5. Um, this is a man who is engaged in sexual immorality with his stepmother in, in uh, um, adultery. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. To deliver such a such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so whether you're sending a person to Satan or sending Satan to a person, right? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure measure and recall a lot of times this word messenger is is can be translated variously angel or messenger um, this is a person a demon unclean spirit that is sent to paul to buffet him and to knock him down with the explicit purpose that um he should not suppose himself to be something when he's nothing 
God has given him these amazing revelations. And so he thought, oh, you know, I press my button and God answers. I pray my prayer and God begins down to listen to me. Right? And so you start to get this, like, this uh, strutting, proud, entitled um, supposition of yourself. And uh, certainly happened many times throughout history. And God's like, well, you know, I need you. You're my apostle. And so you're not, you're not going to do that. And so I'm going to send a demon to knock you down repeatedly. You recall that Paul prayed three different times for God to take it away. And so, you know, in the, in the context of authority, if anybody was going to have authority in the church, it would be Paul. Paul saw all kinds of signs, wonders, and miracles. He cast out all kinds of demons. And you think that he would say, you demon, you messenger from Satan in the name of Jesus, I'm an apostle. Don't you know who I am? Right? But God sent the spirit. And so Paul recognized that he had to do with God. And ultimately, if he was going to ever have any kind of authority to cast this this, um, messenger from Satan out, and to bind him and to stop him, it would be because God gave the authority because God is the source of all authority. There is no authority apart from God. It doesn't exist. Maybe it exists in, in me wanting myself to be puffed up and me wanting myself to be strong and powerful and mighty. But God's the person who's strong and powerful and mighty. I'm poor in spirit. I'm weak. I'm a sinner. I'm infected. I'm stained. I'm defiled. And so like... If, if I'm going to successfully rebuke a devil and contravene a devil, it's going to be because God warranted it and made it happen, not because I'm anything at all, right? And so, um, next I wanted to just read uh, possibly the most obvious passage, because there's more, and that's just out of Job. And I... Uh, I really was not trying to take a huge amount of time in this video and so I'm just I think what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to read Job chapter 2 1 through 10 you see the exact same thing in chapter 1 right Job never acknowledges anything other than that he has to do with God okay and so uh, even though the devil the devil is the causal agent of his suffering. Um, so Job 2 verses 1 through 10. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came along among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Watch out for your adversary the devil like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour right and uh, verse 3 and the Lord said to Satan hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth a perfect and upright man one that feareth God and escheweth evil and still holdest fast his integrity although thou movest me against him thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause and Satan answered the Lord and says skin for skin yea all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. Notice there's not a not a peep of protest, not a peep of a peep of a peep of a peep. Not a whiff, not a but I wanna. Nothing like that. It says God God issues his decree. Behold, he is in thine hand, save his life. Verse 7, Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Whoop! He went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with soul boils and from the sole of his feet unto his crown. And he took him a pot shard to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil in all this did not Job sin with his lips. And so the lesson is just exceeding simple and in the context of all the other verses that we've read, God, God sent the spirit 
and God sent the Spirit for his purpose. He didn't send the Spirit because the Spirit got one over on him. He didn't send the Spirit because he forgot that he left Satan in the earth because he's wringing his hands like, oh no! God sent the Spirit because everything is about him, by him, for him, and through him. Everything is intended for the glory of Jesus. And Satan is God's handmaiden and puppet to see his purposes accomplished on the face of the earth. God uses Satan, baptism and fire. He uses Satan. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He uses Satan as a tool. In his hand, not any different than an axe or a hammer or a screwdriver. God uses Satan in his hand as a tool to chastise, to judge, to sanctify, to purify, to train, and to strengthen the sons of men. And he's doing it for his purposes and his glory alone. Now, what does that mean for us? That kind of sucks. Like, that's hard. But you know what? Dealing with sin is hard. And the fact that God has made a way for us to be our our sins are like crimson. I will make them white as wool. That God has made a way to cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. When he didn't have to do it, he could just leave us in it, in the muck and mire. He could have left us. And so that, that God is doing anything at all on our behalf, and ultimately all things are working for our good, right? And so that God is doing anything on our behalf in order to actually train us up and for our good and for our prosperity, right? That is amazing. God would use his wisdom and his strength and his power and his resource to benefit us. It hurts in the short run, but it pays dividends in eternity, Okay. Eternity is about God. Salvation is about God. It is not about us, even though we benefit from it. And he is using all things for our good and for his glory.